As Richard had mentioned to you earlier, one of the purposes for being here was, in many ways, synchronous, coincident, not only in terms of its topic, but I think also in terms of its relevance. As you may or may not know, we're poised on the next decade being the congressionally declared decade of the mind. Not the brain, we have that one. The decade of the brain looked very focally into the substrate that was the gray stuff. It didn't tell us how the gray stuff makes great stuff. David Chalmers' proverbial hard question of neuroscience, how does brain make mind, looms before us. And it's not just a question of how brain makes mind, but how is it that embodied brains are minds, embedded and nested within the systems that are integrated, that are the world and universe in which we live. In many ways, the pursuit of the decade of the mind looks at larger questions. Those are questions that ask, what is the nature of our reality? How do we know that reality? How do we interpret and internalize that reality and not only make sense of it for self and define self, but what does it mean for our relations to others? Other human persons, other organisms, that may person, and the world and universe Indeed, one of the things we're finding is that the scale at which we live, the very scale at which we judge our experiences, is the scale, not necessarily of the way our mind works, but the way our social dimensions work, the way we have been entrained to interpret our events in the universe that are, in many ways, anachronistic to a mindset that looks forward. That's a 25 buck way of saying, we're working on the wrong schedule. <laughs> but we're learning more and more, not just about the brain-mind, but about the embodied self in which that brain-mind is embedded, and the environment in which it's nested is that it is multi-scalar. Some of the more fundamental questions of the field that I deal with as a neuroscientist, neurophilosopher, and neuroethicist include the nature of free will profound, because it stretches from the synaptic all the way to the social, from the level of the cell to the level of the litigious. But moreover, one of the things we recognize is the dynamic of ongoing temporal and spatial interactions. <laughs> and, and what that actually means for the way we live our lives for the way we understand our lives. So for example, we find that the field of neuroscience is one of consilience, a term first coined by the sociobiologist E.O. Wilson at Harvard University. It's a field that brings other fields together, and interestingly, looks not only within, but beyond. It brings together physics, chemistry, biochemistry, biology, psychology, sociology, anthropology, cosmology, and beyond, the theological, the transcendent. Oh yes, don't be surprised. What we're finding ever more now is that science recognizes that it is not a non-overlapping magisterium with those areas of the humanities that heretofore have been considered to be on the fringe, esoteric, myth. We're learning ever more that the nature of our reality in the here and now may in fact be militated on time scales that we can't necessarily perceive. Time scales that may move very, very much in two directions on the smaller level, only to instantiate our reality moving forward on the level at which we engage each other socially, perhaps cognitively, and very much emotionally. But that doesn't mean that those time scales and the forces at which they exert not play an influential role in the way our brains create minds and the way our minds intuit the shifting architectonics of our social, emotional, and spiritual planes. Indeed, perhaps what a science of the brain-mind will allow is an understanding of not only what we know, but how we know it, and in many ways dispel older anachronistic mindsets and open the door to possibilities. That's why you're here.
the topic of synchronicity, the topic of coincidence, the topic of linked circumstance is one that has been adorable philosophically and proverbially when it comes to the emotional construct of the human person. Why do I do the things I do? Do I have free will? How does my past influence my present? How does my present influence other presents? How does the future influence me? What is the nature of the interactions that I manifest both in my daily existence and writ large with the universe on the whole? I have the pleasure not only to speak to you tonight and frame the field in such a way that opens the door for our erudite speakers, but also to partake in this discussion with them. Each and all will bring a particular facet of a lens that I think is critical. The scientific side, the humanity side, and on the side of practicality and understanding how we live our lives and what it means to live those lives embedded and nested within an environment that we don't fully understand. What does such an understanding obtain? What does it entail? Indeed. Such an erudite panel includes, by way of introduction, Dr. Jeanette Nachman, who is former director of education at the Ryan Research Center, where she is also a research associate. We have Robert Perry, a well-known scholar, who is the author of this recently published book, Signs, A New Approach to Coincidence, Synchronicity, Guidance Like Purpose and God's Plan, which is published by Simeon Press. He's also well-known for his work in A Course in Miracles, and the idea of connectionism with regard to meaningful and parallel events. We have Professor Bernard Beitman, who is former professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Missouri, author of well over 100 published papers, and editor of the recent psychiatric panels that actually address the topic at hand. From a multidisciplinary perspective, as psychiatry is, and perhaps importantly so, as we move on to what the nature of these experiences are and their interpretations, not necessarily as things that are esoteric or outside of the norm of our daily experiences, but perhaps things that need to be incorporated both into the therapeutic milieu and to our discussion of normality as we move to then formulate new constructs and nosologies with the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the Psychiatric Association. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Paul DeBell, psychiatrist here in New York in private practice, who has dealt with the notion of coincidence, both in the therapeutic clinical encounter and in the lives of those patients because of the profundity of its effects. Hopefully the next couple of hours will not only be a learning experience for you, but will be an insightful experience because it opens new vistas that allow you to peer into the nature of your experiences, past and future, and also give you the opportunity to engage each and all of our panelists in the nature of discussion that may, in fact, illuminate some things, provoke and be provocative towards others, and perhaps nothing more will leave you with a stimulation to understand your world a slightly different orientation. But understand, what each one of us then do is we take that information and we create a personal epistemology, a meaningful sense of how we know and what we know. And I think what becomes important to launch this discussion is to understand how each and every one of our panelists came to the field that is, in fact, so engaging, that is so, in many ways, provocative, and has for a long time been seen as parascientific, esoteric, and in the past on the fringe, but perhaps no longer, as science literally gets its head around what it means to get your head around an embodiment in an environment of past, present, and future. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask each one of them to spend but five minutes in relating their personal conjoinment to this particular topic so as to shed light on how their personal experiences instantiated their professional work and then bring you into that conversation. Following those five minutes, I'll ask each one of our panelists to discuss the lens through which they peer into the phenomenon and meaning of synchronicity. At the end of all of the panelists' presentation, I'll then open it up for all of you to discuss, to engage, to question, to pose particular situations that you may find to be meaningful or quizzical. 
And what we'll do is we'll end the night not so much on a discursive note, but perhaps on a dialectic note. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start in inquiring with each one of our panelists tonight to provide for you about a five minute overview of their personal conjoinments to the field. And we'll start with Dr. Jeanette Docker. Dr. Nachman, please. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Do I have to do something that is, doesn't screech? Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and to be talking about one of my favorite topics, synchronicity. I suppose that one of the reasons synchronicity is so near and dear to my heart is that I've had really a number of very remarkable synchronicity experiences during my life. So many, in fact, that at various times different friends have dubbed me, quote, the queen of synchronicity. Now, I don't think I'm the queen of synchronicity. But I do think I have a lot of synchronicity experiences, and I definitely pay attention to synchronicity more than most people. And there may very well be a connection between the two. But I don't think it's simply a matter of um, my uh, kind of projecting meaning onto coincidences that really uh, aren't unusual. So I'm going to start off by giving you an example of my earliest memory of a synchronicity. And that actually occurred here in New York at the 1964 World's Fair. But it was, it was actually the last day of the fair, so it was 1965. I was a little kid at the time. My family had driven to New York from Philly. And the plan had been to rent a stroller for my youngest brother, who was a toddler. Well, we got to the fair, and there were no strollers to be had, because it was the last day of the fair and one of the busiest days ever. But at some point during the day, my father uh, spied what appeared to be an old broken down uh, abandoned stroller off in some bushes by one of the pavilions. And he fiddled around with it. We had a working stroller for the rest of the day. Well, um, that evening, as we were getting ready to leave the fair, my father called his oldest and dearest friend, a guy who had been best man at my parents' wedding, to let him know we were in town and see if he and his family wanted to join us for dinner. When his friend heard we were at the fair, he exclaimed that he had also been at the fair that day with his family, but they had had to leave early because someone had stolen their stroller. <laughs> at which point, I distinctly recall my father saying, is it blue? Now, that was a very meaningful event for me. That's my earliest memory of synchronicity. It kind of kicked off a lifelong interest in this stuff. My father's friend, who was a, a psychoanalyst, remained convinced throughout his life that the only way we could possibly have gotten the stroller was that obviously we had seen him and his family at the fair and had uh, taken the stroller as a practical joke. So same event, in one case a very meaningful synchronicity, in the other essentially a non-event. And I think that happens a lot with synchronicities and the extent to which we pay attention uh, and how it really affects how we think about them. I'm going to give you one more example. Um, this is um, I think a good example of what can happen after you've been paying attention to synchronicity for 25 or so years. And, uh, and this example actually has a preface uh, during a time when I was sharing a house with a guy who was doing a psychology internship at the hospital where I had done my medical training. And one day he came home and he asked if it would be okay if we uh, hosted a visiting applicant to his program that night, or actually a, a few days later. And I said, sure. And a few days later, we had this very nice guy um, sitting on the living room sofa. Well, um, it turns out that our house guest was a graduate student from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And my housemate was applying for teaching positions at the time, including uh, Urbana-Champaign. And an interesting thing happened. Their lives crisscrossed. That's to say, uh, our house guest did get, essentially, my housemate's old internship slot. And my housemate went on to get the teaching position at Urbana-Champaign. And I made a mental note of that at the time, because that's not the sort of thing you see every day. Well, now we're going to fast forward a few years. At this point, I was a graduate student in uh, clinical psychology in North Carolina. And one Sunday morning, a classmate called to offer me her living room furniture. She had gotten a new set and um, gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. And a few hours later, I found myself surrounded by brand new furniture. And I was so excited by this unexpected windfall that I did something very uncharacteristic. I spent the rest of the day cleaning. 
Well, the following day, I went into the psychology department to see a notice on the bulletin board asking if one of the grad students could host a visiting applicant to the program that night. And as I read the notice, a few things went through my head. First, I thought, hmm, I'm in a better position to host this guy than anyone else here because I spent all day yesterday cleaning as if I was expecting company. And come to think of it, I spent all day yesterday cleaning as if I was expecting company. And because I saw life through the prism of synchronicity, if you will, I basically decided to host this guy to see how things would play out. So that night, I found myself seated across this very nice fellow in a local Chinese restaurant. And at some point, I asked him how he was going about picking which grad program to choose. And he looked at me, and he said, I'm being guided by the principle of synchronicity. <laughs> well, of course, I thought that was great. I told him I had also been guided by the principle of synchronicity in my decision to host him. And we went on and had a delightful conversation about synchronicity. Well, that night, we returned back to my house. He called his um, faculty contact at the next place he was headed. And I realized it wasn't, uh, you know, the next morning that I had never asked him where he was going, uh, you know, where he was interviewing next, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And of course, the person who he called from my apartment was none other than my former housemate. Needless to say, he ended up at Urbana-Champaign as well. And in case you're wondering, I'm not normally in the habit of hosting visiting applicants to programs on my living room sofa. In fact, these are the only two occasions in my life when I've done that. So I'll stop there, but it uh, gives you a flavor for the kinds of things I'm talking about. <laughs>